Let us pray. O oh God, may the words of my mouth and the meditation of all our hearts be an acceptable offering in your sight. Amen. <clears throat> in Deuteronomy, in the reading you just heard, we are in the midst of an impassioned speech by Moses. He was like a doting parent trying to give all the advice he could to the Israelites before he left them. Moses knew that he would not personally reach the promised land. So he did his best to make the role of a prophet clear to them. Perhaps you know of a young person who has left home to take training, get a job, or go on an adventure. Parents are inclined to let their love and their fears be expressed in the form of advice. And I won't ask you if that has happened, but um, some of us are probably guilty of that. Moses was no different. In the verses just before today's reading, he warns the Israelites at verse 9, and this is just before what we heard today. When you enter the land the Lord your God is giving you, do not learn to imitate the detestable ways of the nations there. He listed what he considered detestable ways. Probably modern parents have their own take on that and let their son or daughter know what to avoid. Having that knowledge from Moses, or today, from a parent or an interested person, can often give the moral backbone that is needed. Moral backbone gives the power to do what is right. Moving to the New Testament, every one of the Gospels has its own wonderful attraction. Matthew, the tax collector, carefully linked the Old Testament lineage of kings from Abraham to David and on to Jesus. Luke, the doctor, was a gifted writer who researched his material carefully and put emphasis on relationships such as in the parable of the Good Samaritan. John's gospel assumed that people, his readers, knew the basic facts about Jesus. And thus, the book of John reflects on and interprets the meaning of what Jesus had said and done. New Christians find the book of John spells out clearly the basics of the, our faith. Right now, the lectionary our assigned readings. The lectionary uh, directs us to Mark. I personally like the book of Mark because it is so clear and succinct. He did not waste time and went right to the heart of the matter. He went right to the heart of it all. The key, the key to our faith. Jesus. It helps to imagine the book of Mark as a concisely edited documentary film. There is little dialogue and personal reflection. One author observed that Mark shows Jesus scattering miracles like rice at a wedding. Matthew and Luke each give four chapters of historical warm-up before recording a miracle by Jesus. Mark covers three miracles and a group event in the first chapter. Mark is a gospel of exclamation points, words like amazed, astonished, terrified. A phenomenon was loose on the earth and Mark was determined to capture the impact for future generations. In today's reading, Jesus was teaching with authority and demonstrating power over demons. Our contemporary understanding of mental illness gives another perspective to Jesus' actions. And in both his words and his actions, Jesus was challenging the status quo of the local religious leaders. 
Jesus was opening up the scriptures to the crowd, enabling them to hear the word of God in new and invigorating ways, in ways that truly spoke to their lives. First, he liberated the word of God, and then he liberated the spirit of the man. What a lot of freedom there was there that day. Freedom is often the enemy of power because people in authority sometimes seek to limit the freedoms of others. Jesus showed us that we can go beyond societal or other constraints and achieve freedom. We can share a sense of freedom in the same way as a candle's light is passed from one to another at a Christmas Eve service. From one to many, the power is shared. To give us insight into how this power from our faith can truly make a difference in individual lives, I'm going to share parts of a chapter from a book by Bob Golf entitled Love Does. Notice that the title doesn't fill in and make a full sentence. That's up to us. Love Does. This author has the ability to take an incident from life and link it to the life of Jesus. Here is some of his story. I, but I, I have to preface this with, these are obviously his words, and I, um, he, uses, he uses the word guy a lot. And I find it, I, I don't use the word guy because I was taught not to. So um, please forgive the, the use of the word guy here, but it fits him. When I was in elementary school, he says, I played little league baseball. I wasn't much of a sports guy. I suppose I was okay, except for the catching and throwing and hitting aspects of the game. I had a uniform, a cap, a glove, and baseball cards in the spokes of my bicycle. So the coach let me on the team and put me out in right field where very little happens when you're that young. Nobody hits the ball to right field. I was bigger than the other guys on the team, so everyone assumed I could hit. The fact was, I couldn't. Because I was such a big guy, I almost covered the plate. I wasn't afraid of the ball, and the pitchers weren't very accurate. So part of our team's strategy was to send me to the plate to get beamed by a pitch or two each inning. My sad, sad batting average was the result of this one bad fundamental. Every time I swung the bat, I closed my eyes. <laughs> All season long, the only way I got on base was by getting hit. Somehow, our team got to the playoffs. In the first playoff game, it was tied Battery failure. We did test them before. There we go. All right. Oh, that sounds better.
So in the first playoff game, it was tied at the top, in the top of the fifth inning, and it was my turn to bat. The pitcher missed me with the first couple of tosses, and suddenly I had two strikes. I wanted to end my season with a blaze of glory, so I clenched my teeth, tightened my grip, and decided to go down swinging. The last pitch came from the mound. I closed my eyes and swung as hard as I could. I heard this dull flap and felt a new sensation in my hands. Somehow, I had connected with the ball. I was so startled at first that I just stood there. Then, someone on the bench shouted, run. So, like Forrest Gump, I ran. I galumphed, that's his word, I galumphed around first base and watched as the ball sailed out into center field, bounced off the top of the fence and fell over on the home run side. As I rounded third, I soaked in my glory as I stampeded toward home plate, arms raised high, making a referee's signal for a touchdown because I didn't know the difference. In the end, the other team scored about a dozen more runs in the next couple of innings, and we lost miserably. But I hardly noticed because my home run was playing over and over in my mind. A week or so later, I was in my room and my mom told me I had some mail. I opened the big envelope and inside was a card. When I opened the card, the words, you are the apple of my eye, had been printed by Hallmark. In handwriting below were the words, wow, what a hit, Bob. You're a real baseball player. Love, coach. I reread the words over and over. Wow, what a hit. I thought about the dozens of times I had struck out or just stepped in front of the ball, hoping my current black eye could heal before I got a new one. I read it over and over again out loud. And not only was I a real ball player, I was the apple of his eye. I do know one thing. Having somebody say something good about you really makes a difference. I think God speaks something meaningful into our lives, and it helps us change the world regardless of our shortcomings. God's name for us is his beloved. He hopes that we'll believe him, like I came to believe what the coach said about me. God hopes we'll start to see ourselves as his beloved, rather than think of all the reasons we aren't. Sometimes we don't think that the name someone picked for us is accurate. How could the coach think of me as a real ball player? And how could God think of me as his beloved? But then, I remember Jesus said to one of the guys with him, that he was a rock. Even though Jesus knew that same guy would ever deny, would deny ever knowing him, I think Jesus was calling something out from inside Peter. <clears throat> it's over 40 years later, and I don't have reason to think about little league or elementary school days often. But when I do, I still think about that card from my coach. In my mind, I can see myself pulling it out of the envelope. I can see that it's shaped like an apple and inside the words from a kind man. You're the apple of my eye. Wow, what a hit, Bob. You're a real ball player. Love, coach. Words of encouragement have their own power. And when they're said by the right people, 
They can change everything. What I've found in following Jesus is that most of the time, when it comes to who says it, we each are the right person. And I've concluded something else, that the words people say to us not only have shelf life, but have the ability to shape life, end quote. Each of us has the power to change the day for someone, including ourselves. Like Jesus, like the baseball coach, we can influence others in a positive way, even if only by extending a friendly greeting. We're now about to head into the second month of the new year. May God grant you the courage and determination to follow Jesus in whatever way is appropriate for you. And as you do that, there are two things to remember. You are beloved of God. And secondly, to God be the glory. Amen.